Welcome to episode 13 of the Think Wildlife podcast. Today I will be interviewing Dan Bucknell, who is the executive director of Tusk, a wildlife NGO working to tackle the illegal wildlife trade and habitat loss across the African continent. Welcome, Dan. Thank you very much for having me. Despite immense efforts to tackle the poaching crisis over the last few decades, Poaching is still on the rise in Africa. Why is this the case? I think, put simply, it's because there's still demand for these wildlife products, whether it's ivory or rhino horn or, or pangolin scales. Part of the problem as well is that uh, the, the poaching has moved around, uh, where you know we where the conservation community has been able to uh, clamp down on poaching in certain areas um, and disrupt local networks. So the problem has shifted elsewhere. Um, I mean, take rhino poaching, for example. Uh, rhinos have had very mixed fortunes um, over recent years. Uh, in Kenya, for example, um, they've reduced poaching of rhino to zero last year and absolutely no poaching incidents um, whatsoever. Uh, in South Africa, for example, uh, in uh, Kruger National Park, they've been able to successfully reduce rhino poaching there. But losses have been on the rise in areas outside of uh, formerly protected areas in KwaZulu-Natal province, for example. And we've seen spikes in recent years in Botswana um, and most recently in Namibia in terms of rhino poaching. Um, so it's mixed fortunes and we see the we see the patterns of poaching shifting around. Um, we had seen um, poaching of the, of the sort of the large mammals, uh, the ones that people would tend to think of when we think of poaching, the rhino and the elephant. During the COVID years, um, poaching of those had dropped simply because it was impossible um, to move and traffic the um, ivory and rhino on uh, during all the lockdowns. Uh, but that has been on the rise again uh, since then. Uh, so we are seeing it, uh, it peaking back up again, um, albeit not quite to the levels they were several years ago. Uh, but also we saw over COVID, you know, what people don't often think of it as, as poaching. Uh, poaching can apply to, to numerous species. And across Africa, uh, during the years of, of the COVID pandemic and lockdowns, uh, because of the lockdowns cancelling international tourism on which so many of the rural areas depend, uh, we saw a big impact on, on local economies. Uh, and we saw lots of spikes in local bushmeat poaching purely for subsistence um, when local economies and local tourism collapsed. So it's it's a very mixed picture um, and one that's constantly evolving. So what are some of the greatest challenges most conservation organizations face in tackling the poaching crisis? Uh, in, in many respects, it's the scale of it. Uh, you know, it is such a multi-million dollar um, you know, international um, enterprise uh, with very complex trafficking networks um, running parallel um, to, you know, an immense uh, legal trade of everything. If you think of all of the, the international, you know, shipping and, and freight that's done, um, then the smuggling that goes on within it, um, it, it can be very difficult to detect. Um, it's also facilitated by high levels of, um, you know, of corruption, um, you know, uh, insider knowledge that's undermining conservation efforts. Um, and, you know, uh, as in so many walks of life, it can be a bit like an arms race. It's a, it's a battle to keep one step ahead of the, the poachers and, and their networks. Um, we have, of course, seen at its most basic level um, the, the, the lack of resources is a problem um, and you know especially for rangers on the front line of conservation um, and that was part of the reason that that tusk um, and natural state natural state created uh, the wildlife ranger challenge which we'll go on to talk about shortly so the demand uh, for ivory has dropped by half in china one of the primary markets for this white white gold so what has caused this decline and what has been the broader implications for elephant conservation yeah uh, china has um as you rightly say china has been um a big driver of the uh, illegal ivory trade um over the past 15 years or so um there was a a, a large and significant one-off sale of legal ivory 
uh, to um, to China in 2007. Um, so one that was sanctioned by CITES um, with a supply of, of ivory from, you know, from, from previous confiscations or from natural mortality. Uh, but the problem with that was that it facilitated the illegal markets um, and which which led um, in um, a very large part to um, a lot of the, the illegal trade and, and poaching that we've had over the past 10 to 15 years. But back at the very end of 2017, on uh, December 31st, 2017, in fact, China announced um, that it would be closing its domestic ivory markets. Uh, and this had a massive impact. Um, the, the price of ivory was already dropping sort of in anticipation of the announcement and with uh, with, with China's, China's efforts in these areas. But that had a that had a very significant um, impact. Um, the, the price of ivory fell, um, poaching did fall, um, that the trade did drop. Um, but that's not to say that that more work um, isn't still needed. Um, you know, there's it's one thing to introduce the ban and another thing to um, to enforce it. Um, there's still um, a lot of issues on the, uh, the, the 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 Chinese borders, particularly on the border with with Vietnam, with illegal trade still happening there. Um, there are still loopholes in um, some of the the exemptions, for example, over antique ivory. So. You know, it's it's not gone away, but it has dropped significantly, um, and you know, it's had a big impact on elephant conservation. Um, the levels of poaching aren't what they were, um, but you know, they're still higher than we'd like them to, to be. It's I think it's estimated now at about ten to fifteen thousand elephants still being killed for their tusks each year. So, which are the other markets for ivory around the world? Well, um, China has been the predominant market in recent years, um, but you know there's been there's been trade all over the world. I mean, there's there's been demand, you know, in the USA, um, there's demand in, in Europe and, and UK, albeit on a on a on a far lower scale. It's it's only in the past year that the UK Ivory Act came into force um, uh, to clamp down on the the, the legal markets in in ivory, the the various. Um, exemptions um to to ivory whether it's for antique ivory or um you know ivory in historical uh, artifacts um all of which was purely legal uh, but um but facilitating the illegal trade as well so there's much tighter exemptions now under the uk ivory act to stop any loopholes there um but yeah i mean you know there's there, there has been trade and illegal trade um all around the world but the the main market has in the past 10 15 years certainly been to china what are some of the projects dusk is involved in in terms of tackling the illegal wildlife trade and poaching Tusk supports the core costs of a number of organisations across Africa. We're a, a partner organisation. Um, we believe that it's the local organisations that are best placed to, to tackle the threats on their doorstep. Uh, last year, we supported um, 79 different projects across 23 countries. And across 20 of these countries, our support to some extent went to supporting rangers or community scouts, um, especially their operating costs um, and training. Um, we've seen great successes in a number of the, the projects that we have supported. Um, where we've seen success in tackling poaching, it's been a combination of having uh, sufficient, well-trained and well-resourced rangers uh, combined with um, good intelligence gathering and analysis uh, on poaching activity and the networks that they're supplying to try and disrupt those. Um, and finally, um, you know, some level of community engagement and support. Uh, if you've got uh, the local communities engaged in, in the work you're trying to do, then they really act as an extra buffer zone around the, the, the areas you're trying to protect. Um, in terms of specifics, um, you know, I could pick out um, any number of our projects we've supported over the years. Um, but for example, we've had a long standing partnership with the Southern African Wildlife College on the outskirts of Kruger National Park, uh, for example, um, and their training of field rangers, among other things. Our support there has also gone towards their very successful anti poaching canine unit um, and their aerial surveillance unit. Um, so all of these it, together combine to to have great effect in tackling poaching. 
Uh, in Uganda, for example, we've supported the Ugandan Conservation Foundation and their, their partnership with the Uganda Wildlife Authority to help restore Uganda's national parks to, to great effect. Um, you know, our support has helped has helped Uganda Conservation Foundation um, and the Uganda Wildlife Authority develop and restore some of the park infrastructure from, um, you know, ranger posts, marine ranger posts, um, even up to the, the uh, park headquarters um, and operations rooms. Uh, and that's enabled them to get to a position where they can introduce uh, the, the park management software like Earth Ranger, which is now one of the the leading um, the, the leading platforms for um, for managing um, parks very effectively for managing protected areas very effectively uh, linked digitally with all the sort of the radios and with information gathering to have real time information on what's happening across the park. Uh, but we've also with Uganda Conservation Foundation we've we've invested a great deal in their work with the local communities. Uh, we're actually um, at the moment working with them on a, a project that's also in partnership with a development organization uh, called Ripple Effect, um, uh, which used to be known as uh, Send a Cow. And that's working to build bridges between the wildlife authorities and, and the local communities. Um, the Through Ripple Effect, they're supporting sustainable agriculture as an alternative livelihood to, to poaching in the communities around the park. Meanwhile, with Uganda Conservation Foundation, we're supporting the vocational training for, um, for, for youth um, around the park to support them and the local economy. Um, and we're also involved there in providing conservation education, um, reaching people through our Pan-African Conservation Education Programme, and also supporting community and school trips into the park. I think even just getting people into the national parks to learn more about the wildlife and the conservation work being done there can make a very big difference to, to getting them on board with, with conservation initiatives. Um, and then I know we'll go on to talk about this, but um, uh, but of course we've uh, we've been um, involved in uh, running the Wildlife Ranger Challenge since 2020, which has been a a big big level of, provided a big level of support for rangers on the front line across the continent. So moving on from the illegal wildlife trade to a habitat loss, which is one of the leading causes for wildlife extinction around the world. So what is driving habitat loss across Africa and what impact has this had on wildlife? Well, it's always a sensitive topic, but um, you know, one of the big drivers of habitat loss has been the growth of the human population within Africa. Um, the human population there is, is growing faster than anywhere else on the planet. And by 2050, it's estimated that a quarter of the world's population uh, will be Africans. Um, so as the population grows, so it expands more and more into, into rural areas and land is converted for, um, for settlements and agriculture. Um, but of course, for a long time, it's been um, a, a problem of uh, the exploitation and demand for resources, whether it's mineral resources or for timber extraction or other forest products. Um, you know, there's there's that's there's been that demand and that continues to this day to open up these formerly um, remote, inaccessible areas. Um, Which species are the most impacted by habitat loss in Africa? To to a greater or lesser extent, I mean everything is is impacted by uh, by habitat loss, as we're seeing. You know the loss of some very uh, you know important uh, ecosystems, uh, but of course those uh, with the largest ranges are set to suffer the greatest. Uh, you know if we think of the ranges of um, elephant and lion, for example, they're particularly impacted uh, by by habitat loss. Uh, lions, in particular, the numbers of which are are down to you know perhaps 20 22000 across the continent um so you know there are as few lions as there are rhinos um you know they now occupy less than perhaps 8% of their historic range uh, but it also depends on what habitat is being lost there's a big uh, problem um across africa with the drainage of of wetlands for example um you know which which um support um you know many 
very specific species um, and uh, our Tusk Conservation Award winner last year, um, the Prince William Award winner for um, conservation work in Africa, uh, uh, Chile's Yero Hunga, his, um, he won the award for his efforts in protecting the wetlands of Uganda um, and having I, you know, identified and formally protected 12 Ramsar sites in, in Uganda by now. Uh, can you talk about some of the work Tusk is doing to tackle habitat loss across the continent? A number of the projects that we support, you know, as well as tackling poaching, they're also tackling the threats to habitat loss so the rangers are not just you know protecting their species they're protecting the habitat uh, the projects that uh, we support last year alone um, together um, are protecting as many as 54 million hectares um, of land uh, and this includes not just national parks but a number of uh, community areas uh, we've supported since inception, really, um, the development of community conservancies, um, you know, particularly in Kenya, um, the likes of the Northern Rangelands Trust, um, which um, has has really championed community conservancies throughout Kenya, um, taking the lead from Namibia, where we we still to this day uh, support uh, the community conservancy movement there, and looking for opportunities to you know to to expand that elsewhere uh, to engage more and more communities in in protecting uh, the, the the wildlife and habitats um, where they are linked to habitat loss is the increase in human carnivore conflict in africa why is a human carnivore conflict on the rise and what implications does this have on conservation yeah well like you say with loss of habitat comes human wildlife conflict uh, as more and more wild habitat is lost and humans encroach more and more into wild areas. So they are going to increasingly come into, into conflict with wildlife. Um, what we've seen in many parts of Africa is, is in fact, you know, for example, more elephants are being lost to human elephant conflict um, than being lost to poaching in some areas. Um, and, you know, as, as for carnivores, um, you know, the more and more um, people are uh, in these rural areas, particularly trying to manage their livestock, so livestock becomes an easy prey item for for carnivores um, that uh, that sadly uh, but understandably get killed in retaliation. Um, so efforts to protect uh, livestock in these rural areas um, is is key to protecting these these big carnivores. Um, retaliatory killings becoming one of the, the 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 biggest threats to them. What are some solutions to human carnivore conflict and? What are some projects Tusk are working on to foster human wildlife coexistence? Yeah, human wildlife coexistence is is increasingly becoming a, a key theme of, of ours, um, engaging local communities in, in solutions to help protect their own livelihoods as well as the, the wildlife that's on their doorstep. Uh, when it comes to carnivores, um, you know, it can be a, a case of, you know, working with local communities to increase the protection of their livestock um, at night, for example, with predator-proof bomers, um, mobile bomers that protect um, protect their livestock when, when on the move. Um, and so that we can bring the, the loss of livestock down with that, the loss of uh, the, the um, to decrease the retaliatory killings as a result. Um, there are also some very innovative um, approaches going on to, to tackling human carnival conflict that we've been supporting. Lion landscapes in uh, eastern Africa and claws in Botswana, for example, have both been developing very innovative lion alert systems whereby uh, certain lions are collared um, with satellite collars. And when they uh, when they move towards human areas, you know, to, towards settlements and to areas where, where humans have their, their herds. So those herders will receive um, a text alert that lions, for example, are, are in their area and that they should therefore take measures to protect their livestock. Uh, and that's been proving particularly uh, effective to get communities on board with conservation initiatives. When it comes to elephants, uh, 
Electric fences um, have been particularly um, effective, but need to be very well maintained. Um, and then there's been, you know, a, a lot of um, a lot of talk about beehive fences, for example, to deter elephants, um, and they've been proving particularly effective in certain parts of Africa. Could you just elaborate a bit about the beehive fencing and why is it such a great tool to mitigate human elephant conflict? Uh, yeah, well, it's been, it was, in fact, um, uh, Lucy King from Save the Elephants uh, in Kenya who first um, her, who first came to realise that um, that the elephants were uh, particularly susceptible to, to, to bee stings, um, you know, particularly in their sensitive areas behind the, the, the ears, for example, um, and that uh, if one were to erect beehive fences, um, that is a line of beehives, connected by wire so that uh, if the elephants stray into that area and knock the wire they'll disturb a number of the hives uh, sending out the bees um, uh, which which then sting them then these can be you know an incredibly effective deterrent uh, to protect crops from elephants um, with the added benefit of course that um, that honey can be very lucrative um, and, and, and popular with communities. So, you know, it supports alternative livelihoods as well as uh, deterring elephants. Um, and in some areas, it's been uh, so successful uh, that even just playing a recording of bees buzzing is enough to deter elephants. Uh, but, it, but it doesn't work everywhere. Um, it's, you know, there's, there's no single solution to, uh, to human elephant conflict and um, elephants are, are particularly smart and will, will, will find ways around. So you've got to constantly keep, keep evolving and keep adapting your, your approaches to prevent it. So mentioned about the use of electric fences. So what are some of the biggest challenges in using electric fences for mitigating human elephant conflict? Um, well, the, the, the two big challenges uh, for use of electric fences uh, is firstly the cost. Uh, it's not cheap um, to, to, to get the materials for uh, putting up an electric fence. So you've got to be very targeted with where you where, with where you put it um and it needs to it needs a power source um a lot of electric fences will be using solar power these days uh, but in order for them to be effective and remain effective they have to be well maintained and that's often where they fall apart is is if they're not well maintained if they're not kept clear if the if the posts aren't um, replaced when they start to rot, if the wire isn't uh, kept uh, kept tight, um, then they all start to fail. Um, and so, yeah, it's important to 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 have you know teams that uh, are charged with maintaining the fences, um, and I you know ideally from within the local community, you know, empowering them to 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 take ownership of that. Um, but then there have also been issues elsewhere where the the wire from electric fences gets <laughs> gets stolen to uh, make um, snares to trap wildlife. So you have to uh, adapt your um, approach there and, and, and use a different different type of, of, of wire, like a sort of electric cord instead that can't be used for making making snares. Um, so yeah, electric fences um, are can be very effective, uh, but they they do have their limitations, unfortunately. Um, and if they're used to excess, um, then they can, you know, really limit the, the ranging patterns of elephants. Um, I don't think this is happening in, in Africa yet where, where, where um, we as Tusk are working, but I've certainly seen it elsewhere in, for example, um, in Borneo with the, 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 the elephants there, that the use of electric fences is so excessive that it's almost made a sort of you know a maze um, for the elephants to try and navigate their way through um, and you've got very stressed elephants there just trying to find their way through the, the maze of electric fences um, so yeah they've, they've, they've got to be used in a very very targeted way um, and, and maintained well. So now moving on to some of the projects being the, uh, supported by Tusk so you earlier you mentioned about the wildlife ranger challenge so could you just elaborate on this a bit? Yeah, so the Wildlife Range Challenge was born in 2020 in direct response to the COVID pandemic. Um, as mentioned earlier, uh, the, with the, um, the onset of COVID and the lockdowns that ensued, um, with the lockdowns came the overnight collapse of tourism to Africa, 
and so many of the rural areas and the the protected areas particularly in eastern eastern and southern africa are so reliant on uh, tourism for the the local economy that these local economies you know also almost collapsed overnight um, as well uh, meanwhile governments were having to divert their resources towards you know towards public health measures to tackle the the the, the covid pandemic um, and so what we saw was a, a significant drop in resources going towards protecting wildlife and and to funding rangers on the front line of conservation so the wildlife ranger challenge was was born to keep to keep these ranges going to provide a uh, critical funding at a time when it was otherwise uh, dropping for them um, so that they could keep doing what they were doing. Um, uh, especially as mentioned earlier, uh, we saw also saw a large spike in bushmeat poaching in the national parks um, as people went in to, to, to hunt the, the local wildlife primarily for subsistence needs. So the Wildlife Range Challenge was created uh, in partnership between uh, Natural State and Tusk, um, as well as with the Game Rangers Association of Africa, um, to, to raise funds primarily, um, but also to build great camaraderie between the ranger teams. So in the first year in 2020, we had 100 ranger teams taking part um, from across Africa, all competing against each other with a number of physical challenges culminating in a, a half marathon race with a, each with their 22 kilo pack on their on their shoulders um, and and raising funds for their for their ranger teams um, and uh, we've continued it ever since um, so you know uh, as as tusk um, in partnership with with game rangers association of africa um, we've just launched uh, the fourth wildlife ranger challenge this year uh, just now so the first challenges are getting underway and since inception in its first years, uh, it's raised a staggering $16 million um, for, uh, for range teams across Africa, um, you know, to, to, keep them, to keep them in employment, to keep them going, to meet the, their needs on the ground. And this has been possible thanks to the considerable support of the Scheinberg Relief Fund, which from the Wildlife Ranger Challenge's inception, Put up a match fund so that all the funds ranged, uh, all the funds raised by the ranger teams and by the public who are also take part and support those teams is matched dollar for dollar. Um, and it's thanks to that that we've been able to provide such a significant level of funding to the rangers. Um, and we're looking to continue the challenge, uh, even though we've sort of come out the other side of the of the of the COVID pandemic. Um, there is, you know, still much work to be done for rangers across Africa. So uh, we continue to run the challenge to to generate significant funds to to meet their needs, um, and we're looking to use the Wildlife Ranger Challenge as a, a vehicle and and opportunity to help professionalise the ranger sector across the continent. Now moving on to one of Tusk's flagship education programs. This is the PACE program. So could you just elaborate on this also? And what has been the broader impact of this project? The, the PACE program, which stands for Pan-African Conservation Education Program, is in many ways uh, Tusk's only sort of homegrown um, initiative, uh, which was established in 2004-2005 uh, in partnership with Siren Conservation Education. And it was very much in response to an observation that, um, that some communities um, had some communities had arrived at simple solutions to common environmental problems which you know communities not so very far away from um, hadn't managed to, to, to develop and hadn't come across. And that uh, if these simple solutions to environmental problems could be shared, uh, then the, the impact could be significant. Um, so uh, that's how PACE was born and it developed into a set of teaching materials primarily aimed at, at school children of sort of upper primary, lower secondary level. Um, but which can also be used, you know, at community level. Uh, the PACE programme revolves around a set of these educational resources, 
you know, a core teaching book um, called Africa, Our Home, which has uh, topics um, topics central to um, in conservation um, of rural areas and wildlife um, across Africa. So ranging from living with wildlife, which explores themes of human wildlife coexistence in particular, to soil conservation, water conservation, energy and climate change, um, and so on. Combined with the uh, the, the core um, school reader, there's a, a teacher's book uh, that, that that helps structure lesson plans. For example, uh, there's a poster. Um, there's uh, we, we've created eighty action sheets so that um, that the children and communities can properly get engaged with some of the solutions. Um, and also um, at the beginning, there was also uh, 32 films that were created, um, all of which is now available online. So uh, the PACE project has its own website, paceproject.net, where you can access all of these resources um, uh, freely available. Um, and yeah, the 32 films cover all of these various topics. Um, and we've been starting to to add to them. So we made a new film um, last, just last year, and we're looking to to make more and to keep the keep updating the resources. Uh, so you know, as as things keep evolving, and uh, also in response to demand for particular resources on particular themes, so we keep adding to the resources. Um, there's a very good um, uh, and popular reader, for example, on careers in conservation um, to encourage people to to get involved um, in, in many different aspects of, of conservation work. Um, and PACE has been rolled out across the continent. Um, we've um, had the resources translated into French as well, so that it's reached across Francophone Africa. We have some of the resources now also available in Portuguese. Um, and we've reached well, an estimated 750,000 school children across 34 different uh, different countries. Um, so, yeah, the, the initiative is growing from, from strength to strength and the impact it has had has really been to, uh, to foster um, engagement in wildlife conservation, improve understanding of the issues and ultimately to change attitudes and behaviours towards wildlife and the environment. Another community conservation project task is involved in is the C3 project. So what is this project about? Um, well, this is a project in um, in, in Madagascar, um, uh, in and around the uh, Nozihara Marine Park at the northern tip of Madagascar. Um, and here the, the impoverished local community uh, often disregards the laws governing the park, um, whilst the local enforcement agencies lack the resources to stop them. Um, over harvesting and inappropriate fishing techniques have been damaging the the fragile reef ecosystem there, um, and have been impacting threatened species like dugong and sea turtles. Um, and in so in 2013, um, an environmental stewardship agreement was signed between. C3, um, uh, the National Parks Agency and the local community. Uh, the community now receives development support according to its own priorities in exchange for supporting the management of the marine park um, and adhering to its regulations. These include restrictions on harvesting of the mangroves, fishing in no-take zones and use of mosquito nets, which were also catching um, juvenile fish. Um, our direct supporters task has supported the training of almost a thousand junior eco guards from three of the different communities around the park. And these young conservation ambassadors conduct field trips and classroom activities and even perform songs and, and sketches on top, topics like turtle ecology and protection. Um, and by targeting young people, C3 has been spreading the conservation message to, to wider communities um, and ensuring an awareness of environmental, environmental issues among the next generation. Dusk is also involved in various species-specific projects. So one particularly interesting species Dusk works with is the Okapi. Could you just talk about this very unique species and what threats it's faced and what is Dusk doing to conserve them? Yeah, the okapi is such an extraordinary animal. Um, I've I've never had the chance to see one um, in in the wild, um, much as I would love to. Um, but uh, they are only found 
in the forests of uh, of eastern DRC. Um, so, uh, and, and they're particularly elusive despite their large size. Uh, for those who aren't already familiar with the okapi, it's um, also known as the forest giraffe. Its its closest living relative is the giraffe. Um, and uh, yeah, it's it's like a shorter neck giraffe in many respects, or sort of you know an overgrown. Um, horse type type creature with um, a very chocolate covered uh, colored body with these magnificent sort of zebra striped legs. Um, they really are a, a, an extraordinary species, um, but, um, but heavily threatened because they're only found uh, in this small area of forest in, in Eastern DRC. Uh, and so for a number of years, um, since 2015, we've supported, been supporting the Okapi Conservation Project, um, which works in and around the Okapi Wildlife Reserve to support the work of the uh, of DRC's National Parks Authority ICCN um, to and uh, to improve the condition of, of um, the, the, the local communities um, whilst reducing damage to the environment. Um, the Okapi Conservation Project provides a direct support to the local ICCN work there um, and supports healthcare, housing, equipment, supplies, training and more, enabling ICCN to greatly increase the range and effectiveness of, of their activities. The project also has an agroforestry program providing seeds and seedlings as well as training for local people to improve their farming yields from existing land using sustainable practices. Um, this has helped spread the conservation message through remote communities, along with practical techniques for improving their livelihoods and limiting their impact on the ecosystem. Further social assistance is provided with funding for schools and health clinics, fresh water supplies um, and establishment of women's groups running small enterprises. Uh, so, yes, we've been supporting the project um, since 2015, uh, providing support for the expansion of um, the ICCN patrols. Um, and improving their effectiveness and reach within the wildlife reserve. So how can individuals contribute to the great work Tusk is doing and conservation in Africa in general? Well, in terms of supporting Tusk, um, I mean, none of our work would be possible without the donations we receive from the public. Uh, so anyone who wants to support our work can go to our website, tusk.org, um, and click the, the red button in the top right corner to donate. That's, uh, you know, a very simple, straightforward action that, that, that anyone can take. Um, but for those who want to, to get more involved, um, we have a number of um, opportunities to raise funds. Um, we, we have, um, in partnership with the Labour Wildlife Conservancy in Kenya, we run uh, the Labour Safari Marathon at the end of June every year, um, which has a number of uh, international runners and uh, local Kenyans taking part and raising money for, for projects within Kenya. Um, as we've discussed about the Wildlife Ranger Challenge, um, you can go to uh, wildliferangerchallenge.org and uh, support any one of the ranger teams taking part. They all have their fundraising pages now set up live um, and ready to go. But we're also encouraging members of the public to take on their own challenges in support and solidarity with the rangers. Um, so there's plenty of information on the Wildlife Ranger Challenge website, wildliferangerchallenge.org, um, with information about how you can set up your own fundraiser. So yeah, for, for, for that and more ideas about how you can support Tusk, do go to um, our website, tusk.org. Um, and yeah, in general, what can people do do to help um, just sort of spreading the word and raising awareness is key um, and ensuring our own uh, behavior doesn't have um, a negative impact um, or has as little an, a, an impact on the uh, world and, in, and its environment as we can. So thinking of um, our own responsible behavior and uh, the resources that we utilize on a day-to-day -day basis to try and be as sustainable as possible. My final question for you is that what has been your greatest learning from your conservation career? I think probably the greatest learning from uh, my conservation career has been that conservation is simply not possible without the support, engage engagement and benefits going to uh, local communities. Um, I think anyone who initially gets involved in conservation does so for a, a love of wildlife, 
but conservation is really as much about people as it is wildlife um, and for it to succeed um, and be sustainable then local people have to have to be involved have to see the benefits realize the benefits um, and only then can we really hope to to protect wildlife and habitats long into the future so thank you so much for your time it is a pleasure to hear you talk about the great work task is doing thank you to you anish it's been a pleasure on that note if you would like to help the communities living in and around india's forests click the links below to view our alternative livelihood program and buy some merchandise directly from these communities there are over 200 million people who live in and around india's protected areas heavily depending on them for sustenance 90% of the revenue generated is donated directly to these communities help them out they need you now